hello, everybody. It is a privilege to be able to be with you once again and to uh, do one of my favorite things, and that's uh, pitch our mental tent here for a bit and uh, you slow your mind to a thinker's pace and uh, walk through the Word. And uh, so we began a series of lessons on uh, joy, and uh, I don't know of a better book that teaches joy than Philippians. And uh, so we covered the first chapter and dealt with uh, a concept that I simply called the single mind, and that was Paul's mental attitude that he had one thing on his mind, and that was that Jesus would be glorified in his life. And uh, now we're going to deal with the second chapter. And the second chapter deals uh, uh, with another subject. I guess we'll deal with some alliteration here. But uh, chapter one is the single mind, but chapter two is the submitted mind. There are four chapters in the book of Philippians, and each one of them gives us a key to having joy in our life. And if you remember when we were opening this and introducing it, we're not talking about laughing here. Uh, David said, make me to hear gladness and joy. There's a difference. There's a difference between gladness and joy because the scripture says in Hebrews, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. So... I can't possibly imagine Jesus laughing on the cross. There was nothing funny about that. But there was something inherently associated with that cross that something gave him the strength to be able to get through that horrible situation who for the joy that was set before him so what was on the other side of the cross is what gave Jesus the strength to be able to endure that painful, humiliating experience. And it's obvious what was on the other side of that cross. You and me, the church. So joy is the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy. Not love, grin, love, laugh love, you know, laughter. It's, there's, it's a different concept. It's not just being fun. It is, it is an undeniable revelation inside of your heart that you have something that's going to enable you to go through crisis and to go through circumstances and keep on moving. And that's why, especially right now, joy is so important. I'm not teaching you that we're supposed to go around showing how much gum you have above your dentures and just always smiling and laughing. Do you know that most of the comedians uh, in, in this world, uh, they, they struggle with depression? And uh, uh, look at the comedians that have died in the last several years. Uh, Robin Williams, who was, um, you know, started out, came on the national scene with something called Mork and Mindy, went on to superstardom, a guy that, that his, he, was, he was from Detroit. He went to Cranbrook for, to, to school. His, his father was a wealthy Ford executive. Brilliant, brilliant comedian, but took his own life. Uh, on and on and on, uh, John Candy. Um, uh, look at, if you know the sporting world, a guy named Terry Bradshaw, who is known for his jocular way, always laughing, always smiling. But if you read his biography, he has struggled all of his life with depression. It's not enough just to be able to laugh, ladies and gentlemen. Joy is not laughter. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit that will give us the, the, the stick to to go through whatever we're going through. And we're going to go through this thing right now, this, 
this virus episode. The Bible said it came to pass. And it uses that phrase many times, it came to pass. And you can use it in regarding to this COVID situation. It's going to pass. It's going to be a memory. It's going to be in our wake. It's going to be in our rearview mirror very soon. And so um, how are you going to get through it? And how are you going to get on the other side of it? And uh, that's why prayer and the word is so important. Let me read you Philippians chapter 2 and uh, let there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And, and the, the, you know, when we, when we dealt with chapter 1, it is so obvious that, that Paul is a threat to Satan. Because go ahead and lock him up and 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 chain him to these to these to these soldiers. But but he's gonna write uh, 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 he's gonna win his jailers. <laughs> and while he's there, he's gonna write letters that will influence the thinking of millions for years to come. I mean you realize that two-thirds of the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul, but most of that was written while he was in chains. And, and you know, so go ahead and chain him up, but he's going to win his jailers and, and, and write two-thirds of the New Testament Bible and, and let him out. And, and if you let him out, well, then he's going to win continents for Jesus Christ. And, okay, well, then I'll kill him. Well, if you kill him, he's going to win a martyr's crown. And he's going to be talked about, here I am, 2020. Uh, almost 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. He's gone. He suffered a martyr's death but we're still talking about him. That's the single-mindedness of Paul that said, you're not going to stop me. Uh, I read years ago about Genghis Khan who, who met with another king of, a, of an opposing army and they were on the battlefield and they, their, their armies were in array. And Genghis Khan said, I want to meet the other king before we fight and and he met the king and he said um, I, I'm going to give you a chance to um, to capitulate right now I'm going to give you a chance to um, to live and if you get off of your horse right now and uh, and you'll bow down to me I give you my word they neither you nor any of your men will die today and the other king just kind of guffawed and said, why, why should I serve you? Why, I have just as good of a chance of winning today as you do. And Genghis Khan said, no, you don't. No, you don't. And he said, I'll show you why. And he looked at one of his men and nodded. And the man got off of his horse, pulled out his sword, and just fell on it right in front of the other king. And he was aghast at that type of sacrifice. And Genghis Khan said, the reason you won't win today is because my men are not afraid to die. And uh, how do you stop somebody like that? You don't, you don't. And so this first chapter in Philippians is teaching that concept that you, you can't stop this guy. Chain him up, Christ is preached. Let him go, Christ is preached. Kill him, Christ is preached. 
So everything is about exalting the Lord. And and now we're in the second chapter, and he's he's going to expand on this uh, partisan spirit in chapter number two. He, he's going to try and persuade people. And he's going to use three examples. First of all, he's going to use Jesus Christ, and then he's going to talk about Timothy, and then he's going to talk about someone called Epaphroditus, who you many people say, who, who in the world was that? Uh, uh, this, this is from another translation in verse 1. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. <laughs> Do you know, in Luke 2.25, listen to this verse, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That, that of course, is a referral to, to Jesus Christ. He, he was, Jesus is known as the consolation of Israel. And if you're familiar with the book of Acts, in the beginning, Paul's original missionary partner was a guy by the name of Barnabas. And in Acts chapter 4, it says in verse 36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which being interpreted means the son of consolation. It, it means someone who is addicted to, to helping other people. And so when you talk about bows and mercies in the scripture, you're talking about heart. Not 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 <coughs> not just this thing in your chest. You know the Bible said as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And in in the physical we have a heart oracles and ventricles and and auricular nodes and all of that type of stuff, but in the Bible the heart was not that thing in your chest. Your heart was your core beliefs, your thought life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is talking about your heart, and it's talking about your compassion. Paul said, fulfill ye my joy. In other words, would you do me, would you do me a favor? Listen to this verse. Here's John 17 and verse 13. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So, so this, this is Jesus, and what he's saying is, my, my cup is full. But in the... In the Bible, <clears throat> there are several cups. I don't have time to teach you about those. You know, when he was in the garden, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But David talked about he'll, ha he'll make your cup overflow. And, and what Jesus is saying is, if you want my cup to flow over, then settle your differences forever. <laughs> at the foot of my cross. Uh, you see, there's a difference between the unity of the spirit and the spirit of unity. Um, you can go to a ball game and uh, there's uh, the spirit of unity on a ball team. But that's not the unity of the Spirit. It's not the same thing. There is a unity that only comes from the Spirit of God. It is my personal experience that wherever there is faith, there's a lot of excitement. 
But just because you have excitement doesn't mean you have faith in Jesus Christ. There's excitement in a lot of different ventures and venues in this world, but that doesn't mean Jesus is at the center. And, and, and so Paul was after unity. Listen to me closely. Paul was after unity, not uniformity. Um, a uniform is something that, that everybody wears. Let's, let's say in the military, uh, every, the Navy has a uniform. The Army has a uniform. A uniform that is something that everybody wears uh, <clears throat> that, that they are in that body. Uniformity is, is pressure from without. But true unity comes from within. It comes from the Holy Ghost. Because the secret to joy, this is chapter 1, the secret to joy, in spite of circumstances, is the single mind to where you have one objective in your life, and that is that Jesus would be glorified. But we're not talking with circumstances in chapter 2. Chapter 1 is circumstances. Paul's in jail. Paul's in chains. Paul's in dire situations and circumstances. But in spite of his circumstances, he still has joy. Now we're in chapter 2, and he's saying, in spite, the secret to joy in spite of people is the submitted mind. I, I, this, this may be one of the most important messages that could and should be constantly preached throughout the, the spirit-filled world. Be, be, because in chapter 1, Paul is teaching Christ first. But in chapter 2, he's teaching others next. Others are second. And of course, you know what's coming in the next chapter, that you and me uh, were last because Jesus said the last are going to be first. <laughs> and that's why we're going to talk about being uh, 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 this, this servant because here's 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I, 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 ultimately, when you go through chapter 2, you're going to read about Euodia and Sintish. I've never heard anybody ever teach about Euodia or Sintish. But uh, he... He's a, if you, well, this is the book of Philippians. And you remember, you go back in the book, it's just such great history here. Paul is in the middle of a great harvest, and all of a sudden, he has a vision, a man from Macedonia, a man saying, come over here and help us. So he leaves this great harvest that he's involved in, and he goes to Philippi. And he doesn't meet a man. He meets a woman. Lydia, a seller of purple. She's a wealthy cloth merchant. And she is immediately just convinced that what the man is teaching is accurate. Opens up her home. And it's the home of Lydia that began to be the headquarters of the apostolic church in Philippi and ultimately through Macedonia. And, and, and I've shown you many times, I think the man was the guy in prison. I think that's why he said, I thank God for every memory of you. And you go, wait a minute, every memory, you were beaten there, you were put in prison. But what Paul could say was, yeah, but if I would have never been in prison, I would have never met my man. And if you notice at the beginning and the origin of the church in Philippi, there were no men mentioned. It's a ladies' prayer meeting is what it is. I'm convinced Euodia and Sintish 
are two of these other ladies that were in that original group. And it's so obvious they're fighting. And these two women are, are creating a, a, a strife in, in the church. And, and they're fracturing the church because strife pulls the other person down. They, by Paul, Paul, verse 3, he talks about, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Strife pulls the other person down, but vain glory puts you up. Both of them produce discord in the church. When you're tearing somebody else down, you're fracturing the church. When you're promoting yourself above other people, you're fracturing the church. If you study Israel in the book of Exodus and that journey between Egypt and Canaan, what is the one thing that just stands out so prominently in that study? I'll tell you what it is. They're, they're complainers. They're murmurers. And that complaining and that murmuring takes us into the book of Numbers chapter 16 and it it comes it erupts with 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 the disobedience of Korah and, and and if you spend any time studying Korah what did he do he's constantly pulling down Moses he's constantly pulling down Aaron He's constantly promoting himself. So what's the solution? Lowliness of mind and esteeming others better than yourselves. He's not consider, He's not saying, I don't want you to think everybody else is better than you are. I, I, I don't want you to. That's false humility. That's false humility. You, you, you're, you're not saying that they are more gifted than you. What he's saying is, let others have preferential treatment. Let, let, let someone else have it. I, I gave a, a, a lesson uh, several months ago in a prayer meeting to the men, and uh, I had to teach a, a, a lesson uh, on the Internet to uh, another group of young ministers in somewhere between the North Pole and the South Pole, and and told this amazing story of, from NASCAR. And uh, uh, here, here's, here's Michael Waltrip. Michael Waltrip is a NASCAR racer. And, and even though he had known lots of, of winning before he became what would be considered a professional race car driver on the NASCAR, he raced in 462 races and never won one time. And he joined up with a guy named Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt is known as the intimidator. Dale Earnhardt had a phrase. He, he said, second place is first loser. <laughs> he only considered, he wanted one thing to do, and that he was going to win at whatever cost. You, you, if you follow NASCAR, you know there's, there's a, another race car uh, racer, uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr., of course, he's the son of the intimidator, but 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 the World Series, the World Series of the racing world is is the Daytona 500, and and Dale Earnhardt had a race team that consisted of himself, his son, and Michael Waltrip, and he said we're going to win Daytona, we're going to win Daytona, and he said this is how we're going to win it. One of us is going to get ahead, and the other two are going to block for him. And, and even to this day, Dale Jr. confesses freely. He said, I wasn't blocking for anybody. I was going to win. That was my job. That was what my dad taught me. But if you followed racing, Michael Waltrip won the Daytona 500, and he won it because Dale Earnhardt blocked for him. But it was on the last, listen to this, on the last lap, on the last turn of the last lap, Dale Earnhardt lost his life.
But Michael Waltrip won the Daytona 500. <laughs> the intimidator, the one who only cared about himself, said, I want somebody else to win today. And the next year, Michael Waltrip was leading in the Daytona 500 and could have been the only man to have ever won the Daytona 500 two years in a row. All we had to do was keep his foot on the gas, but he looked in the rearview mirror, and guess who's behind him? Dale Earnhardt Jr. And he remembered the lesson that his dad had taught him, and he backed off, let Jr. pass him, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. won the Daytona 500 the next year. <laughs> guess who won it the year after that? Michael Waltrip. <laughs> So a guy who was 0 for 462, the first NASCAR race he ever won was the Daytona 500, and he would have never done it <laughs> if the Intimidator wouldn't have been a servant. And, and it, he's preferring somebody else. This, 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 this is the concept that's in the book of Philippians. And, and, and when, when you get it, it's, it's what I would call the gift of second sight. It, it, when, when you get it, when you could see what others can't see, when, when you develop that gift, quite frankly, you're amazed that other people can't see it because people with the gift of second sight don't even think twice when something needs to be done. They just act. And people with second sight are amazed that someone who is offended over lack of praise. It, it's a larger view of life. Seek your own advancement. And all it's going to lead to is a narrow, selfish, small, myopic. You, it's like you got blinders on. Eh, 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 eh. Listen to this verse. I... I I'm coming to a close, but in Psalms 106 and verse 15, it says, He gave them their request, but he sent them leanness of soul. In the NIV, it says the Lord sent them a wasting disease. We have a lot of hunters in this church, and any man that's a hunter knows what CWD is. It is, it is in the deer herd in Michigan right now. It's known as chronic wasting disease. They don't know where it came from, and they really don't know how to get rid of it. And, and I, there, there is in the spirit CWD, a chronic wasting disease, a leanness of soul. It comes from me, me, me. I need to stop now, but I, I'm going to teach you something Sunday that uh, I really believe the Lord laid on my heart. I'm going to teach you on something called the creative power of Satan. And uh, I, I thought for years there was only one creator. But the more and more I've thought about it, I am convinced the enemy of our soul has creative power as well. So I encourage you to please follow me on Sunday because I'm going to incorporate a lot of Philippians chapter 2 in my lesson to the church on Sunday. And that's as far as we can go today. I, I want you to know that I love you. And it's such an honor. It's such an honor. All of you that showed up in the parking lot on Saturday for my uh, parking lot birthday party. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was humbled and I was moved at what you did. The magnificent cards, all of your efforts to give me a good day. I want to reciprocate that. I want you to have a good day. And so in closing, remember that uh, the secret to overcoming circumstances is to have a mind that's singular, that the Lord would be glorified in your life. But maybe it's not circumstances, maybe it's people. And let's face it, we've all been crowded into homes with people right now. And the way 
you deal with people is with the mind of a servant. And uh, that's what we're going to deal with, submitted minds. I love every one of you. Thank you once again for my parking lot birthday party. I had a grand time. I love each and every one of you, and I encourage you again to be with me on Sunday. God bless you.